All right, let's turn back to Acts 21. Um, I pray this morning that as we look at this scripture that we will allow ourselves to be challenged today by the word of God. That it will not just be a time that we sat and looked and listened, but that God's word comes alive in our hearts and minds. Uh, I really do. I hope in this chapter you can picture what it would have been like to be there with Paul, seeing the difficult situation that he is in and what he still chooses to do. It boggles my mind what he chooses to do here. Um, I'd like to tell our online audience, if you're joining us this morning, um, if you're just checking us out, man, we'd love to have you here. If you're in parts far away, um, hey, we're, we're glad you're here and you're getting the word this morning. Uh, if you'd like to tithe, you can do so by clicking the Tithely app. Um, that always uh, blesses us. And so if you're, if you're prompted in your spirit to do that, uh, just click that link. It's very easy. So if you'll recall right now, Paul has been church planning and then church watering, going back to these churches that he's helped sow and he's been encouraging them. And this has been the pattern for the last two decades of Paul's life. But recently he has felt called by the Holy Spirit to go back to Jerusalem. And God has been preparing Paul's heart at every stop along the way, letting Paul know that he is called there, yes, but he is going to face hardship there. And Paul is not deterred by this, but he obediently follows God's will into Jerusalem, where the Jewish Christians celebrate his time with the Gentiles. But they do say, hey, Everyone thinks you hate Jewish culture now. So how about you participate in this Jewish ritual, most likely the Nazarite vow, and then they'll think you're, you're still on board and you can disciple them. So Paul knows this ritual isn't necessary to his salvation. Um, that's Jesus. Uh, but it gives him a chance to preach to his Jewish brethren so, and it will do no harm. So he does this ritual. It's a seven-day process. So that's where we jump in in Acts 21, verse 26. The next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help us! This man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. So, a few things there. Paul has never spoken against the law of Moses. He's spoken to the fulfillment of it through Christ. Um, and then, this other thing, it's a big taboo. We've talked about it when we went over the ministry of Jesus. Uh, the Gentiles were not allow, allowed into the inner courts of the temple. That was punishable by death. And it was such a big deal that even the Romans were like, yeah, do what you gotta do. Don't go in there. And Romans would tell other Romans, don't go in there. Um, and, but they, the people made an assumption here that Paul is going out of his way, um, while Paul is trying to do a good thing, while he's trying to earn the right to speak into these people's lives, they begin making stuff up that didn't actually happen. And it works. Paul never brought a Gentile into the inner courts of the temple. In the, the temple. He knew, nope, that wouldn't help the cause of Christ. Um, Paul did not do this. If, if, uh, and here's the thing, Paul could clear this up, right? It, it might be hard at first, but if he could just be like, no, no, guys, I didn't do that. Have you ever had a misunderstanding with someone where they think something about you and it's completely not right? And they're like, <laughs> yeah, your sibling. It's like, no, 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 you misunderstand. Guys, I deal with that on, 
you know, in marriage so many times where, you know, my wife will say something and I'll, I'll hear something else and she'll be like, no, I mean this. And I'm like, can you say it again? Slower. <laughs> I love having my kids here. Um, calling me out on stuff. Uh, this is just a, an understanding that could be clarified that Paul could say, no, 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 this person never came in. Show me one witness. Show me two. That's what the law says. You've got to show me two witnesses that they had been here. This was all based on an assumption that they saw this guy with them earlier, this Ephesian Gentile, and then they're like, well, he's hanging out with you, so clearly you took him into the temple. That's not what happened. Paul could clarify it. He could. Um, the tension is mounting now. Verse 30. The whole city was aroused, and the people came running from all directions, seizing Paul. They dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. It feels like we've been here before, right? Like a few times. Um, well, they were trying to kill him. <sighs> trying to kill him. That's a strong language. Have you ever tried to kill someone? Or have you ever had someone try, be in the process of trying to kill you? I mean, a lot of tension. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of stress here. Okay, guys, he's got a mob. Paul is facing a mob who is actively trying to end his life. Uh, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and the soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So a false accusation here snowballs into people grabbing Paul and they're going to kill him. And they probably would have been successful had the Romans not been notified. And the thing about the Romans, what they want more than anything else in, in this province in Israel is peace. They just want calm. They want order. Uh, Romans, especially in this area, Romans have had to put down riots and insurrections recently. In the last couple of centuries, it's, it's a sen sensitive topic for them. Um, they'll just kill everyone of these people that are supposed to be under them and beneath them, that they're in charge of, if it'll just create peace. So when the Romans show up, that's why everybody just takes a step back. So literally, they were just like, ah, ah, oh, ah, like that. Okay, sort of like... When I walk into a room when my children are fighting, all I have to do is just step into the room and the kids are just like, they did this thing. <laughs> you can't see it, but off camera, they, they, they did exactly, they're just like, their fault, their fault, they're the reason, they're the reason the bad thing happened, they're the reason I had to hit them. Um, that happens with, with my children uh, from time to time. Um, that's what happened, okay? Mom and dad, as, as the Roman commander and the soldiers, they just showed up into the room, and the, the Jewish mob is just like, we weren't killing that guy. We weren't trying to kill that guy. What are you talking about? Please don't hurt us, kind of thing. Um, so the Romans show up, and then this next part is crazy, verse 33. The commander came up and arrested Paul. Arrested the guy that was getting beat. Okay? And ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. So, you know, arrest them and then ask questions later. You know, that kind of thing. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another. And since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, get rid of him. So, Paul gets arrested, and, and then the commander asks the mob, which, when we think of the mob, is the mob always thinking rational? No. No. 
Um, and we've seen this uh, recently in Ephesus, where remember the language? It's like the people were in an uproar, and the people, and it, and it says it's like they were all of one accord that they didn't know what was going on, but they were passionate about it. That's what's going on here. Um, and the the commander is trying to get to the bottom of it, and, he, and he's just like, why, why, why did we arrest this guy again? And the mob is all, we heard a rumor, and we're bad at fact-checking. That's literally, they have nothing. They have nothing on Paul right now. But the mob won't stop shouting to get rid of him. In our language, it just looks like they want to remove Paul from the premises. When we say, you know, get rid of him, they don't mean get rid of him and the, get him out of Israel. They don't mean that. They're literally meaning Remove him from existence, end his life. That's what they're, yeah, that, that kind. That's what they're uh, yelling right now. So even though the Roman soldiers are there right now, things are very, very tense. Um, and I would ask, have you ever been in a tense situation like this before? Yeah? You have? Not You've had a mob being like, end her life. Yeah. <laughs> We heard she's bad. <laughs> I don't think you have. I don't think you have. Um, the thing is, to us, that would, be, that would be a bad day. That would be a day that you'd, you'd remember. You'd be like, guys, whew, the craziest thing happened to me this last year. I was in front of a mob, and they were just like, kill him. And to Paul, this is like a Tuesday. Paul's been through this before. And the Holy Spirit has prepared him for this. And it's so cool to me how, even though Paul is, is you know, violence is present, Paul gets a beating here, we still see God being like, Romans, pff, sweep in. Take control, bring, bring about peace. And now something really, truly amazing is going to happen. Something that goes against our rationale, our line of thinking. It's certainly against what I would think to do in this situation. But Paul is being guided and moved by the Holy Spirit. Um, so that's why this next crazy thing happens. Verse 37. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander... May I say something to you? So that uh, is weird there because Paul, uh, they think he's a Jew, therefore he's speaking uh, Aramaic. And instead, Paul just turns to the commander and just in his language, in Greek, he just very politely, after getting beaten by a bunch of people uh, and being arrested, he just goes, may I please have a word? Like he says this very polite in his language, meeting him right where he is. And the commander says, uh, do you speak Greek? He replied, aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago? And Paul answered, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. So while the crowd is screaming for Paul's head, Paul talks to the commander in Greek, and this gets the commander's attention because he thought Paul was someone else, this terrorist leader from Egypt. A lot of assumptions, a lot of, a lot of false assumptions about who Paul is, about Paul's character, by people who don't understand him, by people who haven't actually talked to him or gotten to know him. And Paul goes, nope. That ain't me. I'm not an Egyptian terrorist. I am a Jew from Tarsus. So this commander suddenly realizes, oh, nope, I've uh, got the wrong, we messed up here. This guy isn't a terrorist. He sounds actually like an educated man. Um, why does this mob want him dead? So Paul says, let me speak to the mob that was just trying to beat me to death. Um, he doesn't say, so glad you guys showed up. You guys showed up just in time. Can you please take me to the safety of the barracks? Paul says, can you let me stand in front of this 
mob and talk to them? I don't know about you. Um, that's not what I would do. Uh, in, in my flesh, I would be like, get me out of here. And Paul says, this is right where I want to be. Paul sees opportunity. Um, and so you'd want to think, all right, well, maybe Paul is going to try to clarify what's going on. Maybe he's going to try to uh, explain to them the misunderstanding. Um, he's going to be like, guys, uh, you're all going to laugh. I, I didn't actually bring Gentiles into the temple. I'm, I'm not an Egyptian terrorist. <laughs> Funny stuff. We'll laugh about this. Um, instead, verse 40, after receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. When they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic, he switches back to their language. He knows how to speak their language. Let me tell you one of the reasons, um, I think I had any sort of effective uh, youth ministry for so long was because I was willing to speak their language for many years through my 20s. I felt like a large child still, too. Um, and this was back, I wasn't saying the cool vernacular that I am today, like bussin'. Uh, Trying to get it, at least one message every time. Um, but I was, uh, I was looking at the things that uh, I, I was reading the books they were reading. I was watching the shows they, they were watching. And uh, I'll never forget one of the times uh, this adult leader was like, I can't, I can't connect with this person. I, I'm not meeting them where they're at. I'm not speaking their language. Would you come meet her with me and, and see if we just can't help her open up and just show the love of God to her? And I was like, yes, absolutely. Let's do that. And so... Uh, we went to a local Taco Bell together, and we just sat down. I was having a great conversation. Um, I, at least I am with the other adult leader. And this uh, person is very shy, um, not opening up. And I'm just like, what are you into? And she's like, Twilight and Hannah Montana. And I'm like, oh, are you Team Edward or Team Jacob? And she instantly just lights up. Um, and it was like Team Edward. I'm like, yeah, you can walk in the daytime. So he's got the best of both worlds. And so then we've just, we've made this connection and she just <sighs> opens up like crazy, begins sharing her heart, her uh, experiences, and, and, and she's willing to listen now. And so we see Paul, just a, a master of being able to meet people where they're at. Just even when it's language, he's, he's passing through language barriers. And so just that, with that simple switch from Greek back to Aramaic, he's got the people's attention again. Because they're realizing, it's like, wait, he's one of us. Exactly like how the teens perceive me. He's one of us. Which is why they think I'm so cool and or hip. <laughs> I don't think they think that anymore. Um, so, uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. I got off on a rant. Um, Acts 22, verse 1. Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. Paul lets him know, I'm not originally from here, but I trained with one of the best teachers of the law you guys got. Gamaliel, um, he was this rabbi. He was one of the Sanhedrin referenced earlier in Acts 5. Uh, Gamaliel is the one who says to leave the disciples alone in case what they're doing is actually from God. That lasted all of three chapters. And then Paul, his student, began persecuting every Christian he could find. When Paul tells this crowd he's thoroughly trained in the law, they'd believe him. He references the person, the training, the background, 
When he tells them he was as zealous for God as they are, what they're hearing is, it's like, okay, you're an Old Testament law of Moses abiding, uh, all these 633 rules plus all the ones that were added by the religious leaders, the couple thousand of them now, uh, that you're doing all those to the letter of the law. But what Paul is saying there is, I know what it was to have only rituals and ceremonies, but not actually a relationship with God. You guys are zealous for rules, for traditions, for this specific way of life, but you didn't know God. I didn't know God. That's what he's saying right here. And I think that verse tells us why Paul's so willingly coming back to Jerusalem, despite knowing what would happen there. Paul remembers what he was and he sees it in their faces and he wants them to know the truth. It ain't going to be the truth that sets him free though, not of earthly bondage anyway. It will set him free eternally. But right now, it would have been so easy for Paul just to say, this is all a misunderstanding. But if they could only get it, they could un- only understand who Jesus is, what, what he did for them. They've got the zeal, just not the understanding of who God is. So Paul does what he does instead of clarifying the misunderstanding in the face of this mob, he tells his testimony. Because my man is consistent. Verse 4. He starts by laying out his faults. I think that's one of the most powerful things we can do when we share our testimony. Guys, I'm not perfect. I messed up. I struggle with this. I fell hard. I was far as far from God as I could be. And then he found me. Verse 4, I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As the high priest and all the council can themselves testify, I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, As I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. He replied, my companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was about a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear the words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Just look at verse 16 there. If you could just stop, uh, look at that real close. If you've got your own Bible, uh, or if you're reading one of ours and you have a pen, uh, you should underline that verse. Uh, If you've got a Bible app, you should should highlight that verse. Um, That phrase, specifically, what are you waiting for? In the Greek there, it means uh, don't delay. Don't tarry. Uh, This is such a good thing for Ananias to say here. 
Okay, Paul, you got it now. You understand. You have a call. You've got a job to do. Go be a witness to all people of what you've seen and heard. Couldn't be more clear. We have a problem in the church today. I mean, a lot of problems, but you know we're imperfect people. That's why we rely on Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Um, but we have too many people in the church delaying or tarrying, waiting around instead of going and being a witness to their friends and family and coworkers and, and fellow students, uh, calling on the name of the Lord. Um, we're called to do that, all of us. I didn't say it, Jesus did. He said, go make disciples. Um, but guys, it's easier to delay. Anybody here good at putting things off? I'm so good. I'm so good at that. Um, the amount of times in college that they would be like, you got a 15-page paper due. You have a month to write it. And I'm like, cool. And 29 days would go by. And then it's day 30, and I'm like, time to get started. Uh, one time I... <coughs> uh, a 15-page paper that was notorious for, we had to cite all these references, we had to do all this stuff. Uh, I go into a QT and I get one of those uh, 64 ounce, have you guys seen the 64 ounce cups? These massive, massive cups. And I filled it almost all the way full with this uh, icy caffeinated beverage, this coffee beverage that they had. Filled it almost all the way full. Then I went and I grabbed uh, an espresso double shot. Uh, one of those little tiny cans that are just packed with caffeine. I took it and I dumped it in. And then at about 6 p.m., I proceeded to drink all of it in the span of an hour. I didn't because I was still young. Uh, I was like mm, 20 at the time, I think. And uh, guys... I remember suddenly being very productive for a short period of time. <laughs> a very short period of time. And uh, I sat down at my desk and my mind was racing. And I'm writing a 15-page paper on the Holy Spirit for uh, biblical principles. And I'm just like, yeah, all of these are good ideas. This is amazing. Oh, God is good. Yes, thank you for being with me, Jesus. And then... <laughs> about two o'clock in the morning, I'm like, how come I can't stop shaking? What's happening? What's happening to me? Oh, I don't feel good. Oh, this is bad. This is bad. I woke up around four o'clock with my head on the desk, <laughs> like keys like pressed in, and I just I just like oh, oh I feel like death. And I'm like, how many pages? Eight pages. Seven to go. Okay. <sighs> Suddenly I'm way less productive. I somehow got through it. But guys, a lot of people, a lot of people in the church today, we treat witnessing, we treat sharing our faith like this last minute thing. Or maybe, maybe we'll have a burst at the very beginning of our relationship with God. Or a burst during a, after a, a Bible conference or after camp. And we'll be like, I'm so productive for Jesus now. And we get out there. And we're like, oh, let me tell you my testimony. Let me share with you my testimony, guys. God is good. He wants to know you. He wants to be in relationship with you. And I'll tell you what he did for me. And he'll share it. And he'll be so excited. And then he'll just be like, okay, I'm, I'm good. I'm tired now. And we, and we let our, our spiritual fervor, our calling, our purpose, what we're supposed to do, just slowly begin to drift into the background, slowly fade out until we're like just back to the way we were before. And we're not called to do that. We have to have those people in our life. Thank God for, for Ananias right there for what he said. Just don't, 
Don't delay. Don't tarry. Don't put it off. You know what you're supposed to do. Get out there and do it. Um, don't, uh, the amount of times that, uh, you know, I'd have those wake up moments on a missions trip or at camp where I'm like, right, this is what I'm supposed to do. And then you get burnt out. You guys, you won't get burnt out if you're, if you're doing it over a prolonged period of time. If you're treating your relationship with God and our, our call that he has on us as a marathon instead of a sprint, you're not going to have that problem. So many of us treat our time with God as a sprint. We just got to get through it. We got we to get to the, the next season, the next, whatever the, whatever the next thing God has for us. He's just like, where I got you, learn to be there. Until you get to the next step, he's training you, he's preparing you. Just as we saw last week in Acts 21 where God just prepared Paul over a whole long 50-day trip or however many weeks it was. It was a long time. Uh, As as he gets back to Jerusalem, he's preparing him, preparing him, preparing him. And then Paul is ready to go. This next part that Paul is about to enter in, it's another lengthy period. Of, of the journey that, that Paul is going to have to face, all because of this moment that's happening right here. Um, but he doesn't shy away from the call. He's not delaying. He had to get back there. He had to give this message. This is his last chance. This is his last opportunity to speak to these people. And he's doing it. And he's not making it about himself. He's not making it about you know trying to make himself look good or, or uh, calm the crowd down and be like, guys, misunderstanding. What he's doing is his testimony. Is, this is Jesus This is who he is. This is what it's about. This is the kingdom that is here now, ready for you. The cool thing about your testimony, like Paul's, is it's uniquely yours. You're the only one that can tell it the right way because you were there when it happened. That time that you met Jesus, that time that you asked him to be Lord of your life, that's a thing you don't forget. And all the stuff that led up to that moment, do not sit on that. Do not delay. Do not tarry. It's too good of a story to put off. Verse 17. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. And the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. And this is the thing that sets the crowd off worse than before. Paul could have hedged here. He could have played the crowd for likability. He had them. They were listening. But Paul doesn't. He reminds them of the Old Testament promise that God has been looking to open up salvation to all people, that all who sought him could become the seed of Abraham. It's testified in Genesis, Psalm, all the prophets over and over again. Jesus spoke to it through parables or directly like in John 10, 16. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. And the thing is, the Jews didn't have a problem with Gentiles converting to Judaism. They just wanted them to go through all the hoops that they believed they should have to go through, including all the unnecessary ones that the religious leaders had put upon them. And Paul is saying, no, it's not like that anymore because of the blood of Jesus. And I was called to this other pen. And they can know God the same way you can. We have to stop vilifying them and shutting them out because Jesus' blood can perfectly atone for their sins the same as it can yours. 
This has been a struggle for the early church since Cornelius' house. When Peter went there and the Holy Spirit fell on the entire Gentile household, the church of Jerusalem, the church has accepted it, but not everyone in the church, not all of the members, not all of the Jewish Christians have. And this mob consisting of both Christian Jews and Orthodox Jews is flat out against it. This, <coughs> to fully understand what this mob is here for, this is a riot born of a lie that Paul had brought a Gentile into the temple and then compounded by pride that only the Jewish people are worthy and then compounded more by an ignorance of scripture that is predicated upon religious leaders who added to God's law and twisted scripture to suit their own interest. The, the danger upon danger upon danger, the way the devil works, um, the way our own flesh works. If we want to be an effective church, one that submits to the will of God and seeks to uplift the name of Jesus and make disciples, we have to stand on his truth, upon the word of God, looking at what it says, seeking to understand it, reading it diligently. Uh, guys, the, the amount that we have to remind ourselves of what the word of God says, I have to all the time, every day. Because there are so many times if I don't, I'll start living a different way. I'll start having doubt. I'll start having worry. I'll start having cares and anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. But man, when I go back to the word, when I look at what the word says, I'm like, right, right. I'm not, I'm not called to have any of that. I'm supposed to trust God. I'm supposed to, to cast my cares upon him for he cares for me. I'm supposed to seek him first. And then all that other stuff, it's going to come together in the accordance of his will and his glory. We have to lay down our pride, guys. This is a big one for me personally because it's knocked on my door many a time in my life. But it cannot get a foothold in my life or yours. We cannot give it that. We cannot, we cannot let it in our door because it keeps us from doing things God's way. It puts our will, our agenda, um, our, our, our pride, our sense of self-worth ahead of God's. And that has no place in ministry, in our daily walk with God. We're called to be servants. We're called to operate in all humility. Pride starts so easy. It creates unnecessary walls and divisions in God's people. Um, but we're to cast those out. We're to walk in servanthood and love and forgiveness with one another. Verse 23. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? Um, so the, the Romans, are they don't get any of what just happened here. The mob was listening to Paul one minute, and then they're calling for his execution the next. So to appease them, the commander says, take him and flog him. Um, this was Roman flogging. Um, this could actually kill you, and often did. So it's here that Paul says, uh, just FYI, uh, I'm a Roman citizen, so that means that if you flog me before a due process, you're about to break the law. In fact, I shouldn't actually be in chains right now because I'm a Roman citizen, and according to due process, you can't do that. Um, that was everything that had happened to Paul by the Roman law was illegal, what they were doing to him. Paul's rights have been violated. So the centurion, kind of freaking out, he goes back to the commander. Um, and before we look at that, I just want to point out something about Paul and the similarities between his story and your story. Um, it's simply this. Paul was lost. And then he was found. But even when Paul was lost, God was seeing to it that Paul 
would be thoroughly equipped to one day be able to answer the call. He made Paul a Roman citizen by having him born in Tarsus. He brought him to Gamaliel and had him taught the law of Moses. And then he course corrected Paul's heart when he got Paul, uh, when Paul got off track, he got him back on track on the road to Damascus. Anyone who has made Jesus Lord of their life, your salvation story, your, your backstory, it's unique, but it's also the same. You were lost and then found, and God has been thoroughly equipping you, even when you were lost, to put you in the places that you are today. Why you? Why not other people? Because he knew your heart would turn towards him. He knew you, formed you in your mother's womb. And he's a God that is outside of time and space. So he's got a pretty good idea how to set stuff up for his kids to know him. For those who are called by his name, he has been leading you and guiding you so that you can be a witness to those around you and you might look around you and say, I, I don't really like the place that I'm at though right now. Or I don't understand the purpose that I have right now. I don't understand why I'm here. Guys, I've had those days. I've had those years. When we first moved up here, I had about five years of just kind of doing this with God and being like, why? Why? I don't get it. I don't understand. Paul is about to have those years. For the rest of his life after this moment, he will be under Roman arrest. Always confined to a house or a jail cell or being transported from one jail cell to another. And it's in these places, these dark places, that God's glory continues to be made known again and again and again. Trust God with where he has you. Trust him when he moves you to the next place. Even if that's a place your flesh doesn't necessarily want to be. You think Paul was like, yay, prison. Prison for the rest of my life. Probably not. His flesh was probably like, I don't want to be here. The wonderful thing about the God that we serve is you can talk to him about it. He's a personal God. And if you go to him and just kind of this is dumb, God, I don't get it. I don't understand. You're in good company. Elijah uh, pretty much did the same thing. You know, God, this is hard. I, this is hard. I'm doing what you want me to do, and I'm the only one that's left. Or David saying, you anointed me to be king, and now I'm on the run, for, uh, run from a, uh, the king Saul who wants to kill me, and I'm hiding in a cave. The thing that's great is God still used those whiny people, and if he can use those whiny people, he can use you. Guys, I've been so whiny in my faith sometimes. And, it, and it's, it's not big stuff like uh, in front of a whole mob that wants to kill me. It is the times where something goes slightly wrong. And I'm like, God, this is terrible. You've led me out into the wilderness to die. Like literally, those, those are the kind of moments I've had. God, this isn't fair. This is the worst. Why are you letting this happen? Um, I don't stop loving him, but I don't trust him like I should. And I've questioned him. I've gone to him so many times in my life. And I thank God he's put people in my life and, and he's placed his word in my heart to remind me that he has thoroughly equipped me to do his good work. That at the end of the day, I have everything I need to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love my neighbor and to make disciples. Everything else beyond that is just gravy. Trust him that he's got you to where you are today and learned to trust him better with tomorrow. Verse 26. When the centurion 
heard this, that Paul is a Roman citizen. He went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? He asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship, but I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. When they say interrogate him, by the way, they don't mean like, you know, where were you, see? Nah, you know, with the spotlight. No, they weren't like that. They were like, where were you? Bam! You know, that's, it was very violent interrogation. And so they were about to do this. And now they're just like, he's a citizen? Oh, I don't want to lose my job. And by lose my job, I mean get executed myself for, for doing this. That's against the law. Um, so the next day he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the members of the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. Um, so since they can't torture it out of Paul with flogging, what happened with this mob, they release him of his chains, but he most likely stays there in the Roman barracks because if he didn't, the Jews would kill him. And then the next day, the commander gets the Jewish ruling council all together. The priests, the Sanhedrin, all the, all the spiritually minded people, the religious leaders. Uh, and this isn't the unruly mob from yesterday. Not the, you know, not the zealous people. This is the learned Bible scholars. He brings Paul to them. And surely it'll all get sorted out. Uh, it doesn't. Just, you know, spoilers. Um, but it is awesome what happens next. So uh, it's where we're going to pick up next week. I want to end with this today, guys. Trust God like you never have before this week in your circumstances, with the call that he has for his life, learn to trust him the way that Paul does in front of an unruly mob. I, I pray that you don't have an unruly mob in front of you this week. If you do, give me a call. We'll talk it out. <laughs> um, but let Paul's call to share his testimony, even in the darkest times, serve as a reminder to all of us that we have to get out there and tell people what God has done for us. It's too good not to share. He has equipped you and given you a story to tell about how you met him. So go share it. May the Lord bless you and keep you today. May he make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. I believe Oh, I believe your heavenly father, that his face turns towards you. He sees you. He calls you out. He calls you by name. He knows your name. And then he gives you peace today. In Jesus' name, amen.